It's time for the Spoonie One Wrestling Show. It's time for the Spoonie One. When it comes to wrestling, I am a man of many moods, and uh, I, I ran the gamut from SmackDown to Raw this week, and uh, it was a little unusual because I really hated SmackDown, even though I probably should have liked it a lot more, and I really liked Raw, despite the fact that a lot of stuff happened that I really should have hated. So, I guess you can call it hypocrisy on me, because I, I, like even I don't fully understand it, but... Uh, I actually, I didn't really feel like talking about SmackDown all that much because it it made me really mad when I watched it, and then when I started, I was I was starting to think about what I was going to say for this one, and then I was like, I can't remember anything that fucking happened during SmackDown, so I, I printed my notes up and I can remember. So, um, it started off with Kane coming out with the World Heavyweight Championship, and I'm like, ah, that's why, yeah, that's why I tuned out, like, immediately, because Kane has the belt now, and I'm like, oh, shit. So he comes out and he cuts like the longest, most insane rambling promo I think I've ever heard out of the guy. It's like they've never let the guy talk ever. And this is the first time he's ever really gotten to speak. And so what really killed it for me was the fact that he did this whole screaming thing about he's like, oh, I am the champion finally, but it's not complete because my brother is a vegetable right now. And. I'm like, oh, good, you're like, not only is Kane champion, but we're still on this Undertaker as a vegetable thing. And is there anyone alive who does currently is not ahead of the curve on this one that already knows that Kane is the guy who put Undertaker in the vegetative state and they're going into the next pay-per-view or, you know, they're, they're leading up to whatever the next big event is, like not SummerSlam, but the next one. And they're going to reveal that, oh, Kane was the one and Taker's going to fight him. We're going to have Kane versus Taker feuding again. And this was like, you know, when, when I'm already ahead of you and you cut like a 15 minute promo complete with, and this is what killed me, was the the cheesy, melodramatic Kane music that was playing in the background as he was giving this speech. Like he talked to the production guys in the truck and he's like, guys, I want you to bathe the ring in red light and I want you to play this really shitty music as I talk. So it's like he's this unholy creation and stuff like that. And what amuses me on NXT is uh, they keep bashing Caval for being way too serious. He doesn't smile enough, they say. Like, he's he's just so focused. He's too focused. You know, he's just too serious. I'm like, yeah, you should tell Kane that because you could never make it as WWF champion if you're an angry guy, if you're way too serious. And meanwhile, Kane is like, there will be a bludgeoning! I, I'm so not... just. Smackdown, like, right away. I just, I cannot grow an interest in that one. At least with Swagger. Swagger could actually, like, wrestle. He was... Kane... Here's the thing. People, a lot of people, some people don't understand why I hate Kane so much. And I don't hate the guy. Here's the thing, though. If you've seen one Kane match, you've seen every single Kane match. Where my brother actually, he, he, he can close his eyes and he can call out every Kane match, move for move. Because every Kane match, he has like, you know how like Cena has the five moves of Doom? Kane has like the same thing where he, you know, he sets up with a sidewalk slam, he goes to the top rope, does the clothesline thing. That's like every fucking Kane match. And so, really the only time anything interesting ever happens is when he gets to play the big bully against a little guy like Ray. You know, which is what they're setting up. Which is fine. Uh... Matt Hardy and Christian versus Drew McIntyre and Dashing Cody Rhodes. This this is another one where, for some reason, I obsess over Matt Stryker because all of my notes, basically, have to do with Stryker saying stupid shit. So, Stryker and Grisham keep obsessing over Cody Rhodes not wearing knee pads, which seems like a really stupid thing to me, especially when you're in a wrestling ring and half your offense is, like, dropping your knee on people. Um, Grisham also thinks it's stupid, but Stryker, for some reason, Stryker loves it. He's, like, he says, I love this. I love the fact that Cody Rhodes does not wear knee pads. And Grisham is like, fucking, why? And Stryker's like, I'll tell you why. So he starts listing off all the reasons why not wearing knee pads is a good thing. And not only am I beyond caring, like, like I don't think it's a good idea, but I really don't care. The guy could wear fucking spikes on his knees. I, I don't know. I don't care. And they just keep talking about it, talking about it. So he says, like, um, he, I wrote down the good aspects he listed off. He says, it's a throwback to the old style wrestlers. Nobody else looks that way, so it's unique. And it's easy to hate a guy not wearing knee pads. 
He actually said that. So it's like he's playing a character, and to get you to hate him more, he doesn't wear knee pads. Okay, Striker, rock on with your bad self. I, I don't know. Um, he also mentions that uh, Vince McMahon, he, he keeps trying to build up the fact that Drew McIntyre is the chosen one. You know, like he's Vince McMahon personally handpicked him, and he says, McMahon was at a charity golf tournament in Air Scotland when he, quote, saw Drew McIntyre and saw money. My first question was, what was Drew McIntyre doing at a charity golf tournament in Scotland? Is Drew McIntyre a big golf player? Um, the story on this one is Matt accidentally takes out Christian, Christian eats the Future Shock DDT, and Stryker immediately, because he's a heel, of course, Stryker call, calls it intentional. He, he acts like a complete jackass. Um, when even though Matt Hardy is looking stunned, like, he's like, oh shit, I just hit Christian, what am I doing? And Matt's like, it was intentional! Stryker, it was intentional! And so, Matt's like, oh shit, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And, what, uh, I, I said, weirdly, Christian is the first guy to uh, say it's okay, it's okay, he offers his hand to shake, and Matt Hardy is the one resistant to the idea. He's like, I don't know, do I trust this guy? I don't know. I, I, for some reason, that was weird. Usually it's the guy who got hit and got DDT'd who's like, I don't, was that intentional? I don't know. But no, Christian was the mature one here. He was like, it's alright, I understand, dude. Like, <laughs> but I was like, alright, go Christian. It's Captain Charisma, man. Um... Swagger complains that Ray took a page out of the dirtiest liar in WWE history. It's a good way to get over as a heel. Start pissing on Eddie Guerrero. Uh, he's got Ray two out of three falls to determine the number one contender. And I said, shouldn't Ray already have a rematch clause? Shouldn't he be number one contender? I, I, like, I disagree with the guy getting immediate rematch, but that's how WWE operates, so whatever. Oh, and Alberto Del Rio, also known as the change the channel boring guy. If you don't know, Alberto Del Rio is this guy who kind of plays this really wealthy Latino guy who's, like, really good-looking, and he's he's got a lot of money, and he, he speaks very slowly. He ca he's kind of like a... I always call him, like, the son of the most interesting man in the world. Like, that's kind of... I think that's kind of what they're going for with this guy, where he's like... He's like, I have lots of money. And I don't always drink beer, but when I do, it's Alberto Del Rio. I don't know, he makes no sense. The guy starts talking about, he's like, he's like, bravery is a trait uncommon to many men. But I have lots of bravery. Alberto Del Rio. And I'm actually being a lot more concise than he is because Alberto Del Rio's promos take like seven minutes to get through as he kind of wanders through his hacienda and he's drinking wine and he got this guy pouring his wine for him he's like ah oh, thank you jorge and the guy's like he's like denada sir and the the guy just walk it, it, it's it fucking blows my mind because they all sound the same not not latinos the the promos all sound the same because he like it's, it's just this very slow cadence where like and he does they do like three of these like the, it's like another hideously long alberto del rio promo fucking hell and then Lay Cool are having a victory party because Layla defended her title. Nobody cares. I said, their shtick makes me want to drive nails into my ears. Because what they're kind of doing is like, they're basically the beautiful people of the WWE. That's what they're doing. Only they do this thing where they all speak in chorus and they do like real talk and they just, it, it's horrible. It's so not interesting. And they're doing like co-women's champions because they both think they're women's champion. I don't know. I don't care. They can't wrestle. Um, Kofi versus Dolph Ziggler, and normally I would say Dolph Ziggler is also another turn the channel heat, but this was actually a really good match, and it worked because they told a really good story here, and that, that story was, uh, Dolphy's, uh, Dolphy, uh, Dolph is working on the injured neck that Kofi sustained doing the crazy dive at Money in the Bank through Drew McIntyre, it was really cool, and... Striker, I, every time Striker says something insanely stupid, I feel compelled to write it down. In fact, I started doing this thing on Twitter where I would I would post on Twitter like every stupid thing Matt Striker would say before I did this, and people were complaining that I was spamming their Twitter because I was. But yeah, it was like like every fucking sentence Striker said was stupid. But this is this is one of the better ones. Um, Dolph puts Kofi in the sleeper hold, and Striker says the sleeper hold is quote one of the most lethal holds in the WWE. And even more disturbing is how creepily turned on uh, Stryker is by Vicky Guerrero. Like, he's talking about, like, how she's a cougar and stuff like that. But he starts talking about her like like he's really popping serious wood at the moment. Like, just think of the things I'd do to that cougar. Like, and even 
even greasier than that. Like Stryker is like, he's like, I'd love to put my face between those puppies. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> like Stryker he comes off as such a fucking dirty asshole. Like, like, oh, I just, I hate this guy. Um, Vicky interferes, gives Dolph an opening, throws the sleeper in, and the referee stops it. Clean win over the IC champ. You're looking at Kofi, Kofi versus Dolph at SummerSlam. Uh, Big Show at Luke Gall- Big Show versus Luke Gallows never starts because P- Punk pulls Gallows out before the bell and replaces him with the masked man. Show absolutely kills the guy and unmasks him again to reveal Joey Mercury. What, uh, th- and so uh, m- my two thoughts were, how do they recognize Joey Mercury bald after three years of the guy not being on TV? That was kind of like, like Stryker is like right on the ball. He's like, what, what that? that's Joey Mercury. And I'm like, you're good. <laughs> it's almost like you knew that was going to happen, Matt. Good job. Um, second thing, what was the plan here? Like, what was Punk's plan? He's like, no, 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 Big fucker, big Luke guy, you know, the, the guy who has a comparable size to the Big Show. No, you're out. Little masked guy, you get in and teach Big Show a lesson. And he gets killed and he's like, I should have thought that one through. Guess, yeah, maybe. Um... Another promo, nostril nostril hair grooming tips from Dashing Cody Rhodes. My comment was, okay. <laughs> He's, he teaches you how to use, like, a nose hair trimmer. All right. Another Alberto, Alberto promo about how he has pride. Enough already, just debut the guy. He already bore the piss out of me a long time ago. Oh, and stri- uh, next one. Striker. I'm the smartest man in the world, and anyone who disagrees with me is ignorant. Jack Swagger is headed to SummerSlam. This is the Jack Swagger versus Ray two out of three falls match. So he's like, like Ray. They've been telling the story how Ray has had his ankle busted up, and like Jack Swagger keeps putting him in the ankle lock. He's like, he's like, anyone who disagrees with me is ignorant. Jack Swagger's headed to SummerSlam, and then in the same breath he says, although you can't count Ray out, I have no idea what Matt Stryker is ever saying. The man is a raging, galloping idiot. Swagger spine bu- uh, spinebusters Ray on the outside mat and yeah oh yeah okay I just, I remember this spot he he does a spinebuster on Ray into the mat on the outside and Ray's like oh fuck me my back and uh, Striker somehow tries to sell this as the spinebuster hurting Ray's ankle even more like he's trying to tie everything into the ankle because that's the story is like how his ankles hurt so he spinebusters Ray and Striker says. That hurts a raised ankle even more, quote, because it resonates right down to your toes. Raw. <laughs> I hate Matt Strike. I hate him so bad. This sh- All of WWE programming has suffered so much for them losing uh, JR to Bell's Palsy, like him being unable to broadcast due to Bell's Palsy. You, like, you have no idea you've never heard jr how much the show is lacking because of his absence it's it's amazing he really is the best color man in the history of wrestling like jr no question and it, it he so bad now okay raw on the other hand i liked a lot better and it started off with cena coming out and talking about how he has this big team and they're gonna defeat the nexus jericho comes out and Jericho's got this huge problem. He's like, I just knew you were going to call this your team, Cena's team. Let me get, let's get this straight. I just, like this is not your team. Like I'm not going to be on John Cena's team cuz Jericho is a douchebag. So, I was loving this and they they argue forever, but this was a really good introduction. This is the kind of stuff where like when you've got a really good guy on the microphone, how they can just like they're awesome just by talking. And he really kind of blows John Cena on the water. Although Cena did okay. He was like, look, I don't want to... I, I don't want to... He's like, fine, you want to call it Jericho's team? It's fucking Chris Jericho's team. I don't want to fucking argue with you over this shit. I just want to beat the fucking Nexus. Is that so wrong? And Jericho, of course, he's like, no, no, don't fucking patronize me, Cena. And like, I was, I was loving this. I was, I was loving the whole thing. So the whole story here is that Nexus is this well-oiled machine, right? Like, the, they all trust each other. They're all like a perfectly working engine. They, they all, they don't have a weak link. You know, that's the story. They, they work perfectly together. And John Cena's team is half heels. It's got fucking Edge. It's got Jericho. It's got uh, 
uh, fuck, I can't remember. They, they, like, but like, even even the faces don't trust each other. Like you know, John Morrison and stuff like that. You know, they've all got these egos. They're not working together. They don't trust one another, and they're all scheming against each other. So like like right off the bat, things are not looking good because they don't trust each other. And I was like, they really did a good job telling this story the whole way through, and I like that. Um, this was really a story about setting up the pay-per-view. And again, this is really basic wrestling booking. And, you know, th sometimes when you say, like, the companies like TNA, they don't like to do it the way it's always been done. By that I mean, like, there are certain ways to book a pay-per-view. There are certain ways to book a challenger so that he looks threatening leading up to a pay-per-view. Certain ways to look, make champ to book champions to look dominant going into pay-per-views. Just basic storylines that, that work. Um, and so, when you book them that way, you can kind of say it's, a, it's very status quo, it's very predictable, but TNA has done this thing lately where they, they like to book their pay-per-views and they like to book their angles to where there's always constant swerves where they, they just they swerve you left, right, up, and down, where there's always people turning on each other, the angles never really go the way you expect them to, to the point where it's almost like when you book an angle the predictable fashion, it's actually really unpredictable because they're not, like, you almost expect the swerve so much now that the swerve is the predictable part. So, like, when you go by the book on this, it's, like, it's really good. So it, it's kind of funny how they're, they're really being basic with this thing, and it's coming off great. And so that's how they're doing it with Randy Orton. Randy Orton versus Jey Uso. And it was really just a jobber match where Randy Orton fucking kills this guy to make him look like this, like a killer. You know, like, like, a, really, like a really scary dude coming into SummerSlam that is a real contender for Sheamus. And it's like, it's so simple and obvious that it's working, you know? People are buying into Randy Orton as this guy who can just fucking RKO you and kill you, and, like, they're like, they can do that to Sheamus. Sheamus is in trouble. That's how you That's how you sell pay-per-views. When you think that something cool might happen, like, do like, you know what I'm saying? So, like, they do this thing. That, oh, here's where I start really not to like this one, actually. Um... Sheamus attacks him after the bell, but Orton RKO's the shit out of him. Now Miz comes out because he's got the money in the bank case and he can cash in any time and win the title, right? So I wrote, what makes him think that R-Truth won't come out and do exactly what he did before and scare him away? But Miz comes out. He's like, I'm going to do that. I'm gonna ring the bell, fuck. I'm going to pin this guy. And so the ref is like, I got to wait for Sheamus to stand up because we, they both have to be on their feet before... I, I ring the bell. And so, like, Seamus, he's, like, fucking RKO. He's like, I don't know what to do, fella. And so, Randy Orton comes back in the ring. He's like, he fucking RKO's Miz. And Miz is laid out. And the ref is like... And then they kind of cut to commercial. And, again, this is, like... They're kind of doing this thing where, like, week after week... Miz is cashing in his suitcase, but something happens to interfere with the match and so make it sure the match never starts. So I get a really bad feeling they're going to be doing this for like three months where like every week something happens to the champ, Miz comes out, and then somebody beats him up or somebody knocks out the ref and he can't cash his case in. So they're kind of doing this thing where they keep teasing you like every week he's going to fucking do this. Like I got a bad feeling they're going to roll into WrestleMania with him like every week being foiled again. So that's where I was like I'm, I it's okay for now like they've done it 2 weeks but they got to stop with this stuff. Like I get it. Like he can cash it in any time, but if they keep doing this thing where he he keeps getting punked out week after week and he's not going to be able to cash it in, people are going to not they're just going to stop caring, you know. So um, Edge and Ted DiBiase talk about how Kali is big, stupid, and clumsy. I'm like, what? No! And yeah, he is. Um, Ranjan Singh overhears it, and Kali challenges him to a match tonight. And he actually says some words in English. He's like, you and me in the ring now! And so, something like that. And so Edge agrees on the condition that Kali is off the team if Edge wins. Um, this match never really starts. They kind of... They kind of grappled for like 20 seconds until Nexus surrounds the ring and Edge runs away. Um, they look like they're going to beat up Kali, but then they kind of make an opening and they let him leave. And I think the story here is they're going to make him join Nexus, or they're going to ask him to join Nexus. I'm like, okay, they're getting the great Kali, I don't know. It's it, But again, it's playing into the mistrust 
that is pl- it's plaguing the uh, the WWE team, Cena's team, that like nobody trusts one another. So like it could have been a good move where like it, it's actually kind of brilliant where they're like, oh, we're gonna let we're gonna make people think that we have Kali in our pocket, so they're not gonna trust the great Kali. And so I'm like, okay, okay, I'm thinking anything. I liked it. Oh, and they said um, the the anonymous general manager. And by the way, every time the fucking email rings and Cole stands up to the podium to read the emails. Oh, it's 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 been old. It's just it's grievously painful now. Like whenever that fucking sound goes off, the crowd just pisses all over it. Like if they're trying to make Michael Cole a super heel, it's working because it's the most annoying fucking thing ever. But he books this match where the Nexus has another 7 on 7 elimination match. And this is like every note I made on this particular match has a question mark in parentheses next to it so it's nexus versus the heart dynasty gold dust mark henry yoshi tatsu evan braun and jerry lawler i was like you got jerry lawler there wasn't anybody else in the locker room you could have gotten you got fucking jerry lawler in the ring and so i'm gonna i'm gonna raise my complaints with this match and then i'm gonna tell you okay i said yoshi jobs out to tarver and anyone jobbing to Michael Tarver, future endeavors. Um, <laughs> uh, D.H. Smith from the Heart Dynasty lays down to Slater's side Russian leg sweep finisher. Question mark. I all of Nexus has these really weird finishers. We're like, you don't think they're finishers, but they are. It's kind of weird. Like, um, like, like Heath Slater has a side Russian leg sweep as a finisher, and it's it's really stunning when people are pinned by these moves. It's like a, it's like a common move, you know. It's like you, something you don't even think about. Like people get pinned by you, like what? But uh, Michael McGillicuddy, his finisher is a swinging neck breaker. So this guy hits a swinging neck breaker, and they go one, two, three, and you're like, what? <laughs> yeah. So um, Jerry Lawler is wiped out between commercial breaks. Uh, Gold Dust jobs to uh, Otunga's Spine Buster. Mark Henry jobs to Skip Sheffield's Lariat. Yeah, Skip Sheffield's finisher is a, cl- a clothesline. <laughs> and he beats the world's strongest man with the clothesline. Tyson Kidd is killed by Sheffield and pinned by Darren Young. Oh, uh, what was Darren Young's finisher? He kind of does this thing where he just like pulls you down by the hair and then you're done. You know, it's like, I don't know. Um... Evan Braun starts to run wild, but gets killed by Wade Barrett, so it's a 7 nothing sweep for Nexus. Clean as a sheet. And so, I really liked this match, believe it or not. And it's funny, because I really should hate it. And my brother hated the shit out of it. Um, what, I, what I liked about it is, the Nexus needed this so badly, so badly, to look like a threat to John Cena's team, because... Up until this point, they're just these rookies, you know, who couldn't beat anybody. And, you know, like, one-on-one they couldn't beat fucking, like, Cody Rhodes and shit like that. You know, they, they, they were jobbing out, like, constantly to these to these pros. And so, even though, like, they're seven-on-one, on, seven on one, they're beating these guys up, I don't think anybody in the audience really thought, like, these seven losers are going to fight John Cena's team. They're going to get killed. And so, they really needed... More than anything else, this supremely dominant win. I mean, just like, no question, these guys are killers. So, they got that. And that's good. On the other hand, I really don't like when they just absolutely murder the World Tag Team Champions. Like, they were nothing. They were nothing. Like, you know, D.H. Smith and Tyson Kidd, they just got just destroyed in this match. And so, when you make the Tag Team Champions look like complete dorks that's bad i mean that th- th- it really helped the nexus out but the tag team champions credibility doesn't just tail spin so that's that's the tricky part about you know book and wrestling you know you you don't really want to make anyone look bad and so again that's tna's problem is they try not to make anyone ever look bad so that's why you'll have really dominant monsters like Rob Terry lose clean in like 30 seconds in a squash match, but then Rob Terry will just get like right fucking back up and kill the guy after the bell. So, you know, the one guy won clean, but the the bad guy beat up the guy after the bell. So he's clearly better. So nobody really got over, but nobody looks bad. So 
that's the tricky part about booking this thing is Nexus really needed to kill these guys, but when you kill the tag team champions, nobody's gonna believe that they can that they're at all worthy of being tag team champions when it, when you know push comes to shove. So like, they, like I'm glad they beat up the Usos. That's fine, but you know next tag team that comes around, they're gonna be like, this guy's got killed with a fucking Nexus, you know. So I don't know. Um, it, yeah, it also made Evan Braun look really ridiculous. And that bothers me because they they spent so much time building Evan Braun up as this really good wrestler, you know, who had a lot of heart, who had a lot of skill and talent and stuff like that. And he just got he got he got destroyed. It's not helping Evan Braun out at all. Um, Brie Bella and Alicia Fox. Brie gets in trouble early and tries the thing where they switch with their twin. Uh, Jillian interferes to throw Brie back in the ring, basically like dry humps Brie in the corner, and the ref sees it, and for some reason there's no DQ. Really bothered me. Um, then, out of the distraction, Alicia hits her horrible axe kick. I swear to God, this woman has to be stopped. It gets worse every single time. And you wouldn't even think it could get worse. And it does. I honestly, I, I, I have no idea... Somebody like this is on national TV. I have to believe there's guys backstage watching this, and every time it happens, they go, "Oh, oh, no!" Like, does nobody come back there and talk to her? Like, you got to work on the kick. You got to stop using the kick. She can't do the kick. She so can't do the kick. <laughs> and I, I, and then um. Jillian comes in the ring and starts to sing we, we Are the Champions, so Alicia kicks her too, so we got two kicks in one night. And I figured out, it's not so much an axe kick, as she just kind of like, split legs in the air, and then jumps on their back. Or like, jumps on the back of their neck. It's not even a kick. She jumps on their neck. Like, tailbone to neck. That's her axe kick. It's the ugliest wrestling... Honestly, I cannot remember a sloppy wrestler that I've ever seen. Unless you're, like, going way, way back to fucking, like, Giant Gonzalez. <laughs> you know? Oh, man. Um, oh, Ted DiBiase versus John Morrison. R-Truth sits on commentary. And Truth was actually pretty good. And I, I do not like R-Truth's character at all. Especially since all he ever says is what's up. So, when he actually says stuff other than what's up, shocker of shockers, he's entertaining. So, he starts talking about how, like, the WWE team needs to show some unity. I'm liking it. They're building the match. They're talking about it. They're telling a good story. They're talking about the team needs unity. And, again, um, Ted tries to win with his feet on the rope, so Truth shoves his feet off. Um, shenanigans ensue until Morrison and Truth collide, and Ted gets the win. And they start arguing after the match. I liked it. I liked the, I liked the tension. I liked the, the, the disparity in the groups here. I like the argument. It's working. It's getting people interested in the match, because you're like, will they pull together? They're telling a good story. They're telling a really basic story, but it's working. Digging it. Um, Sheamus and Miz versus Cena and Jericho. Another really good match. Uh, mostly because you got four really good wrestlers in there. Well, okay, three. Cena. Yeah. Um, Jericho weirdly played the the uh, baby face in trouble uh, through all of it until Cena makes the hot tag, runs wild, and then turns around and immediately eats the fucking code breaker. And Jericho walks out and the bad guys get the pin. I'm like, yes! They're making Jericho look really like a bastard. They're like they're going super heel on Jericho. The team is falling apart. After the match, they all get in the ring. They start arguing. They start shoving each other. Um, Great Kali, weirdly, comes down and tries to calm everyone down. You can tell he's trying to like play peacemaker here. He's like he's like stop fighting, stop fighting. But like he's speaking, you know, he's he's. He's speaking, I think it was it Hindi that he's speaking. He's like getting in there, he's like, Hello, hello Greg Ali, hello. And like everyone's looking, like, What the fuck are you saying? And like John Morrison gets in his face, and he's like, He's like, Don't fucking tell me that shit, whatever you fuck you're saying. And and, Mor and Morrison is like, He's got a problem with the great Kali, and so Kali like chops him. <laughs> I think it's weird for Morrison to take that shot. Um, Kali no sells edge of spear, <laughs> chops Morrison for no reason, and that was that was raw. Um, I also saw NXT, and 
I honestly, I missed who was who got eliminated. I I, I didn't see it. I saw ever I saw everything. My brother play, started playing Infamous, and so he's like, oh, you, he's like, I'll tune back, I'll tune back. So he's playing this level in Infamous. He tunes back. I missed it. So <laughs> I don't know who got eliminated. I assume it was uh, Eli Cottonwood because that guy is horrible. But um, what really bothered me on that show was the fact they keep making Caval lose. Caval, who is, like, by and way above and beyond the best wrestler on that fucking show, and he's jobbing out to Husky Harris. <laughs> Husky Harris? Oh, Jesus. Guys, Husky Harris. Uh, that, that's where I saw Michael McGillicuddy's neckbreaker finisher. Ah. Anyway... Uh, that's pretty much all that. Like, but yeah, Raw was was I liked it. Um, it was it was funny how I shouldn't have liked it because yeah, they made the tag team champions and Evan Braun look like complete idiots. But yeah, I mean they were they were telling a story, they told it well, and there was a lot of wrestling in it, and it was it was wrestling done well. They, like everyone had a character, and you know everyone's character really shone through. There was not a lot of talking aside from the first segment. You know, they, it flowed naturally from one match to the na- next. The matches were booked logically. It was okay. It was a really good Raw. And so I, re- I think I really needed to watch a good Raw because they have not been very good up to this point. And, you know, I'm happier than the pig and shit that we're seeing for the first time in, like, 20 years. A main event that does not feature Triple H or John Cena. So, hey. You know... You may not like Sheamus. You may not like Randy Orton all that much, although Randy Orton does need to be rotated out of the title picture as well. But just the fact that, you know, I, I can so appreciate the fact that fucking Sheamus is champion right now, and it's it's not John Cena. Anybody but that guy at this point. So, yeah. Uh, I, I From what I understand, that uh, TNA is, is going to be a whopper because they're really going to start booking the ECW guys in matches, like, really washed up dudes like Tommy and Raven and stuff like that. Oh, it's going to be so bad. Oh, and they're going to have the, uh, I don't know if it's this week or the week after, they're going to have the the uh, stick with nails in it uh, on a pole match. It's not going to be on a pole. It's going to be like a ladder match with the stick over the ring. Oh, it's going to be so bad. So, yeah, uh, stay tuned. Wrestle, wrestle. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of fun. Sorry this one was late. Uh, I've been really busy lately, so uh, tune in next time.